Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Levine Building and the Diego Auditorium at Trinity College. Uh, my name is Hilary Bolding, I'm the president of Trinity and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the second in our series of Trinity Talks, which is a new series um, brought together because we have a space at long last in this building to be able to put this kind of event on. I want to say a couple of words about housekeeping. Our guests are going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then they're opening up the discussion to questions. There are roving mics around the room, and because the event is being streamed, can I ask you to, w to flag you want to ask a question and we'll bring a microphone to you. It's very important that you speak right into it so that those listeners who are listening from outside can hear your question as well. Tonight, we welcome Judge Ted O'Meran in conversation with Shazad Charania. Through his work in the field of international criminal justice and humanitarian law, Judge Merrin is one of the most celebrated legal figures in recent times. Celebrated for his accomplishments in the, field, in the field of international criminal justice, for his humanity, which is a shining beacon against the backdrop of some of the bleakest chapters of our history, and for his lifelong focus on making the world a better and a more just place. Here at Trinity College, where Judge Merrin is an honorary fellow, he's a distinctive figure. Over the past six years, he's been an almost constant presence, and our, our small community has been the beneficiary. Ted has an extraordinary ability to connect with our academic community at every level. It's not unusual for students to approach him and ask him questions about his work, and Ted is generous to a fault. He shares his experience, answers questions of law, shares the human and sometimes lonely position of weighing evidence and applying the law. He's made a particularly deep connection with some of our youngest students. Indeed, he shares a staircase with them, but he's equally committed to teaching and expanding the knowledge and horizons of experienced academics, government officials, diplomats, and decision makers. In 2020, Ted was confirmed, conferred by Queen Elizabeth II with the award of Honorary Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in recognition of his work in the field of international criminal justice. The award is to an order of chivalry the Order of St. Michael and St. George, and it seems particularly fitting for a person whose love is Shakespeare and who's written in particular about war and chivalry in Shakespeare. In his book on the subject, Ted writes, Shakespeare's work contains a plethora of fascinating texts, illuminating chivalry and the humanitarian ideal. Perhaps more than anything else, chivalry meant the duty to act honorably, even in war. Ted frequently expresses his surprise at the turns his life has taken, not least in being appointed an international criminal judge at the young age of 71. In his book, Standing Up for Justice, he writes, Here I was, a person who had missed a normal education, a survivor of the Holocaust, judging war crimes, something I was committed to doing fairly, justly, and without favor or fear. fear. He is a truly honorable man. Tonight, Judge Merrin is in conversation with another distinguished legal figure, Shazad Sharania, who is the Director of Legal Affairs and International Relations at GCHQ. Shazad joined GCHQ after five years at the Attorney General's office, including nine months as its head, where he advised four attorneys general and three solicitors general. During this time, he was also the international law advisor to the prime minister's office. Shazad spent six years at the foreign office, including three and a half years posted to the British embassy in The Hague as the head of international law, where these two gentlemen met each other many times. He's been the national security community's race champion since 2019, He's a regular lecturer on various international law topics. 
Please welcome Shazad Sharania in conversation with Judge Theodore Merrin. Right, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dame Hillary, for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, you used the word honor a few times, and actually it's such an honor for me to be here uh, on this stage conducting this event with my good friend, uh, Ted, Judge Theodore Moron, CMG. Um, we've known each other now for many years, uh, from when I was the British uh, legal advisor in The Hague, as, as Dame Hillary said, between uh, 2013 and 2016. Uh, and it was such an exciting time to be there. Uh, it was uh, at a time when really key judgments from the trial chamber of the International Criminal uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia were being handed down, including uh, as well as appeals judgments uh, from uh, Ted's chamber. Uh, but it was also a privilege to be there during that time because that's when I got to know Ted. Uh, having been Ted, having been just an exalted name on the reading list of my international law master, so suddenly uh, being uh, right in front of me uh, and someone who, as I say, became a friend and uh, continues to be a mentor and a great supporter of my own uh, career. Uh, and it's actually your career path that we're here to talk about, Ted. Uh, and I'd like to focus our discussion in the first instance on uh, your life, really, uh, because we'll get to the substance of the future of international criminal justice shortly. Uh, but I, I, I want to take this opportunity to talk about your life because uh, it's not hyperbole when I say that Ted is the most fascinating person I've ever met. And I hope that during the course of this conversation, you'll understand why I say that. Um, so with that, Ted, how are you this evening? I'm well. I'm so happy to welcome you in Oxford. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Now, uh, Ted, uh, as Dame Hillary said, you, you, uh, you grew up uh, in, a, in a labor camp. You didn't go to school uh, until late into your teens, I think. And yet, at a relatively young age, you became the chief legal advisor of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And not just holding that position, but holding that position in 1967. Uh, just days or weeks, I think, before war broke out. After. After, okay. Um, so, so tell me, Ted, how did you feel when you got that job and the fact that you were so soon after taking that position, advising on matters of law that were ultimately existential for the state that you were in? I was, uh, I must admit, very nervous about it. I did not know whether I would be able to cope. I had only two or three years as assistant legal advisor before going to New York, to the UN. So uh, when it happened, uh, I agonized about it a lot, but I had no time to agonize because the war was so urgent and so overwhelming. I um, uh, never thought about um, the existential nature of the opinions that uh, I was asked to give, and I think we will be talking a little bit more, more about them. I, um, um, I think that a legal, for a legal advisor, in my vision of the job, a legal opinion is a legal opinion. It may concern matters big, it may concern matters small, but I believe that legal advisors have the professional obligation to call the law or the subject that we are they are discussing the way they see it. They should not uh, present a cosmetic version of that. And this is what I did and I tried to do all my life. And it was an opinion that you gave in 1967 on the lawfulness of settlements in occupied territory uh, that was unearthed in, I think, around 2005-ish, certainly uh, around, that, around that time that brought you into the, into the news uh, because it was revealed, uh, in case the audience doesn't know, that uh, you advised at the time, uh, uh, or just after the war, I think, that uh, the building or, or the transfer of civilians into settlements in occupied territory was unlawful under the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how that opinion was received 
uh, noting you know, the, the, the activity that we've seen subsequently in Israel. Well, many people felt that the best way of treating that opinion is by ignoring it. By not, um, it was a secret opinion and I'm not a person who leaks things to the media. But um, um, for me, that actually when I look back and I realize from the reaction which came later that those three pages were perhaps the most important pages that I've ever written. Not my 13 or so books, but those three pages are the pages that in a way became very, very famous. Uh, I did not uh, agonize about it. For me, it was, uh, it was uh, a true and instinctive obligation to tell the prime minister what I felt about it. I uh, do remember that when I was appointed to the job, I came back from the United Nations. I spent the six days in New York in the UN. And that was the time when decolonization flourished. And I felt very strongly that it is wrong in our period to have anything which resembles colonization. And I gave a very simple opinion, three pages. And I said that uh, there is no question that the establishment of civilian settlements in occupied territories is a clear violation of explicit provisions of the famous Geneva Conventions, number four, the Civilians Convention. Um, I, uh, I wish that uh, my opinion would have been uh, um, followed. I think had it been followed, we would have been so much closer now to a situation of peace in the Middle East, it was not followed. And um, uh, successive Israeli governments, whatever the political setup, uh, labor, center, right wing, they were all unanimous in ignoring my opinion. Um, I feel that uh, I did what uh, my integrity as a professional legal advisor um, um, had to do. Uh, I have always believed that legal advisors, it is a term which I think was historically developed in, the, in Great Britain, are officers of the law. And I mean it, officers of the law. And in, I think you did this role, Ted, for about 10 years, didn't you, the Israeli uh, MFA legal advisor. Um, and you following that role, took on, you stayed, I think, in the foreign ministry, but you took on some non-legal roles. Uh, can you talk about the, 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 the positions that you, you filled during that time and ultimately what drew you away from that life into uh, academia after that? Well, I think that uh, I have always been an academic at heart. Um, and a generalist at that. And, uh, but of course, it is not you, it is circumstances in life which determine what you can do, what you cannot do, what is available, what is within the realm of reality, and what is uh, a, a utopian objective. Um, I believe that the fact that I spent some years as a diplomat, were quite those years were quite essential to my sort of education as an international lawyer. I came to know the United Nations. I learned a lot about international relations, about contact with people. And um, uh, regarding uh, the change, the constant changes in my life between uh, subjects of law, which interested me, but also my formal occupations, I am a great believer in change. I believe that change is good for me, change is good for all of us. It keeps us young, even if I say so. <laughs> um, uh, and I believe that life has, uh, after the abyss of World War II, life has compensated me with an incredible number of uh, opening and opportunities. And I was lucky to be able to seize those opportunities. And uh, let me just say, a few words because there are many law students here that I followed the same idea of change uh, as well as ambassador to the UN in Geneva 
uh, and your first foray into academia wasn't in fact in 2014, it was 20 years at NYU Law School, uh, as well as Harvard. No, I was speaking of my return to academia. I, uh, um, but I just wanted to fill in the gaps for the, for the audience there. Um, so as I say, 20 years at NYU Law School, Harvard, Geneva, um, uh, and- Berkeley. Berkeley, thank you. Uh, I'm sure there's others <laughs> as well. Um, and uh, this, uh, for most people, would have constituted an entire career, but it wasn't even halfway through yours. And uh, it was around, I think, at the end of academia, and this was when you had become a US citizen, you entered into the world of international criminal law. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about that? Um, when, um, of course, what started it, leaving aside my memories of World War II, uh, was um, the atrocities in the Balkans. I was terribly concerned about it. And um, when it started, was a member at that time already of the US Council on Foreign Relations. I wrote a piece in the Foreign Affairs magazine stating the case for war crimes trials for former Yugoslavia. And soon thereafter, uh, Richard Goldstone, Justice Richard Goldstone, was the first prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal of the ICTY, invited me to The Hague to brief the, his team, his prosecutorial team, on the seminal Tajik case, which really changed international law in making it clear that the rules governing international wars apply also to the most cruel of conflicts, which are domestic uh, conflicts. And uh, then I was uh, appointed, still as an academic, to the US delegation to the Rome Treaty where, as you know, we drafted the Rome, Rome Treaty, the statute of the first permanent international criminal court. Um, that was an incredible experience. Here you had somebody whose knowledge was mostly academic, um, working with professionals from the State Department and the Department of Justice, and given, believe it or not, a role, a real role, in drafting provisions on war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, it was an incredibly exciting period of time. And as a career a tenured academic at NYU, I was much less constrained than my co career colleagues from the Department of State, Department of Justice, or the Department of Defense. And, um, um, I also had the unusual uh, honor of being asked by the delegation to deliver the principal statement on uh, the crime of aggression. Uh, it was an unusual conference. Uh, the atmosphere was giddy with hope and incredible expectations. Here we were gathered in Rome to, to construct a new edifice of international justice. Um, uh, our hopes were unlimited, uh, perhaps also our expectations somewhat unrealistic. It only reminded me of one other conference where um, the US was kind enough to send me as one of the public members. It was the 1990 uh, Copenhagen Conference on Human Dimension. Uh, Gorbachev was still the leader of the Soviet Union and we were all hoping that finally uh, human rights, uh, the Helsinki declarations, democracy will triumph uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, we were hoping, and this actually did happen, that with Gorbachev's help, the wall will fall. Um, it was a difficult time for me in Rome from a different perspective because um, um, the U.S. had major problems with the Treaty of Rome, and um, we were somewhat, the delegation was somewhat of a pariah in Rome. But nevertheless, the fact is, looking backwards, that the U.S. delegation, because it contains so many professionals 
made quite an important beneficial contribution to the text. And in fact, it came up with the idea which later appeared to be quite important uh, to, to come up with this idea of adopting the so-called elements of crime. So, Ed, at this point, I think, or, or shortly, shortly after you came back from the Rome conference, uh, you became a state counselor at the uh, State Department in the US. Uh, and it was at that point, I think, that you got the opportunity to become a judge, what you've already described as the most uh, fulfilling part of your career at 72. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that came about, that opportunity to become a judge? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a story. Um, I was, uh, uh, my experience in the State Department was, uh, uh, I had been probably eight months or so in the State Department, and they probably appreciated what I was doing. Uh, Patricia Walt was a senior judge um, in, the, um, um, in the DC circuit in Washington DC. Had to resign from her judgeship. She was the American <coughs> judge um, on the ICTY because her husband was not well. She had to come back to the United States. And the US usually t takes quite seriously uh, appointments or nominations as a judge. And I said to myself, well, nothing ventured. Um, so I applied. And, um, and I did not believe my eyes. Uh, there were five candidates, two of them district, federal district court judges, one academic, one the US ambassador in charge of war crimes, and your humble servant. And um, they selected me. Uh, they selected me, which caused some problems because uh, the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albrin at that time, wanted her ambassador to, to, be, to be the nominee. So she, she wanted to go against the recommendation of the, the appointments committee, and, and she decided that way. And then somebody leaked this development of the news. There was a story in Washington Post that uh, the Foreign Office Association were upset about this development. And in the meantime, the administration has changed and they looked at it again. And six hours or so before the expiration of the date for, for changing nomination, they submitted my nomination to the UN. And, uh, here as well. I was, and actually, the challenge for me personally did not end with that. Here as it was an ex-Israeli diplomat, a Jew. Um, it's, it was uh, at that time not all that common that you would be chosen as a judge. And uh, I said my, to myself, if I don't make it, people like me will not be nominated in the future. So I felt that there was a certain responsibility here. And to my amazement, uh, one of the um, key diplomats, I, I will not mention who he was and uh, his nationality, said that he said to my elections officer in the American delegation, I read uh, Ted Merron's CV. I am sure he would be fair to Muslims. And then elections came. We were 16 to be elected. I was the third highest in the number of votes. And I could not believe my eyes. But I often had luck in life, but except for the second vote. And, and so, Ted, tell me, tell us a little bit about how being a judge compared to your previous careers of being a diplomat and most recently being an academic. Well, it was, um, it was, the change was nothing short of being existential. It really required a complete overhaul. Um, an academic, um, I had to drop, to depart from academic habits. So by codes of conduct, which exist in every country, I think, and certainly we have a number of um, 
international codes of conduct uh, for judges. Uh, the relationship between a legal advisor and, uh, and his government it goes far beyond, in my, in my vision, beyond client, uh, um, um, client um, attorney relationship. I feel very strongly that there is uh, a common denominator between being a judge and advising government. You have to follow, um, uh, to, to follow um, the law. You have to be honest. You have to state what the law is, even though you may at the same time help your government in articulating a presentation of that which perhaps would be a little bit more acceptable to international public. Um, um, a judge's obligation is not to reach a particular result, a conviction, or an acquittal. It is to follow the principal process, which um, adheres to the rule of law. Um, any external purpose, even if that purpose is very desirable, is outside of your agenda, and international justice would be demolished, it would be destroyed, if judges would follow extraneous agendas or political considerations. At times, it gets you into tremendous trouble, as you know, uh, uh, from because you are aware of the criticism that was voiced, um, voiced against me when, in a number of cases, very few, I, um, I am uh, leading the appeals chamber. I um, joined my majority, sometimes even the whole bench, in uh, reversing convictions, but I believe that uh, um, acquittals, just as convictions, are part of a mature legal system in which judges will uh, follow the principle of the law. Uh, it's something uh, uh, which you have to believe very, very strongly and follow totally whatever the consequences. And, and, and Ted, I remember uh, that period uh, around 2014, I think, where you did receive a lot of criticism, and it was what what I think was particularly stark and wrong about it was that you were singled out for that criticism, even though you were in a bench of five, and in some cases a majority of of three. Uh, and I know. Uh, that you took it very personally because you were so principled or had such a principled approach in, uh, in, 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 the, in the judgment writing that you felt personally stung by this. Um, but not content with just being a judge, Ted, you decided very soon after your appointment uh, with, a, with, a, with a few years of practice in the appeals chamber to take on the role of president of the tribunal, and not just one tribunal, uh, not just the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia, but also the mechanism for the International Criminal Tribunals, which was the, uh, which was the uh, kind of mechanism which dealt with the residual issues arising out of both the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal in The Hague. Um, so what made you want to go from dispensing justice to the administration of justice? Well, actually, I would perhaps restate a little bit your question. Sure. I did not depart at all yes. from dispensing you, justice. You did it at the same time. I yeah. did it at the same time. I have always felt that credibility is credibility of still frail, very young international criminal courts depends uh, on the quality of leadership, on whether judges are willing or presiding judges and presidents are willing uh, to try to establish a greater economy, um, a sort of stricter budgetary provision, leadership. Um, and um, I believe that the credibility of international criminal courts depends at least in part on the leadership that they get. But I was in uh, my first presidency of the, of the ICTY came as a total surprise to me. I, um, 
I came to The Hague in 2001, in November. Uh, the last uh, few months between my election and going to The Hague, I spent uh, reading books on criminal procedure. And um, I was quite sure that I will go on the trial court. Of course, I was a new judge, despite my 71 years and you know, on my passport. Uh, but um, um, after a year or so, um, after two years, um, Judge Claude Jordan, my French colleague, was at that time president of the court, had to, decided to um, try to get um, a judgeship in the ICC, in the International Criminal Court. He was elected, and here we had a vacancy. And my colleagues uh, uh, suggested that uh, I submit a that I um, ran for presidency, I was elected, and over the many years at The Hague, over 20 years, I spent there. My colleagues honored me with uh, four elections as president of the ICTY, and three uh, uh, mixed appointment election um, as uh, president of the uh, mechanism, residual mechanism. It, um, but uh, the important thing to realize I accepted additional functions. I accepted functions of oversight of, exam for example, the register. Um, I um, uh, accepted additional representative function. A president of the court has to go to appear in person every six months in the UN General Assembly, uh, sorry, Security Council, and um, try to obtain as much support as he can for the institution. He assigns judges to, their, to the cases. And of course, you are constantly watched by the parties. They watch the way you assign judges, and they ask themselves, or they tell you, you have created a biased bench. So in order to deal with that, for example, with regard to the benches, what I did, I followed the principle of the taxi stand appointing the next judge in, in line. And uh, in order yet even more to, to eliminate uh, accusations of bias, I would, be, I would routinely and always follow suggestions from the staff. And the staff would tell me which of the judges uh, is next in line. But um, in being a president meant that a president of the court meant that I also presided over the appeals bench, which in terms, in professional terms of uh, being a judge, being a lawyer, is perhaps the most exciting function. And um, I just uh, looked the other day and um, I presided over more than 30 appeals. So I feel very good about this part of my life. Uh, there, I think, I did really try to make a real contribution to this evolving, to this new uh, branch of international international criminal law. But uh, uh, I did not um, depart from dispensing justice. I yes. did just more of it. Yes, uh, and in fact, I mean, I want to talk about, um, I want to look to the future in a second and move could, to- Could I just add a yeah, word please. to you? about, um, about um, the criticism that some of my mm. uh, opinions um, have, uh, have um, triggered. You mentioned two opinions, the one which was unanimous, Parisi, and the one which caused even more controversy because it was not unanimous, it was three to two, was uh, Gotovina. Uh, Gotovina was a Croatian general, was uh, convicted by the trial court for 24 years of imprisonment, quite a heavy sentence. And um, we got this on appeals. I don't want to speak about technical parts of the case because I don't believe that judges should do it. But um, we had a majority of three, which I led which um, um, by majority of three against uh, 
there were two judges who, in very who wrote very, very strong dissents, um, um, who were for, uh, they felt that we should find another basis for convicting Gotovina. I felt that if something was not pleaded clearly in the trial chamber, to jump this on a appellant during the appeals proceeding would not be fair. But this caused an incredible number of um, critical comments in the press. Um, uh, and what, um, what I took particularly to heart was not the comments for people from people who are against international justice, but my friends were against me. And papers uh, with whom I'm sympathetic were against me. And um, um, the choice was to react, to explain. I believe that this would be, have been completely counterproductive. Judges should be silent. They should take criticism stoically and hope that people by reading or rereading the judgment one day will, um, will uh, change their, uh, their view. But these were very difficult times because uh, I may have, um, I do have quite a few qualities of leadership, but there is one quality of leadership which is very important and which I have never acquired, and that is having thick skin. I take criticism very, very much to heart. And at that time, I was uh, on my third term as president, and uh, the judgment in Gotovina was given in, in November 2012, I believe. And um, um, I was um, uh, a candidate, and I was so fed up with the criticism, which very often was really ad hominem. I was singled out. Uh, as you have kindly pointed out, that I felt I think you were accused of being an Israeli agent. Uh, and, and Pentagon agent at the yeah. same time. I mean, if you do something, do it. Um, and um, to think that I, and but at that time, of course, my Palestine opinions were known. So to suggest that having written those opinions in uh, immediately after the Six Days War, I would be likely to be an Israeli agent makes really absolutely no, no bloody sense. Um, and um, uh, Pentagon, uh, well, uh, let me tell you one thing. There is lots of things about politics in the US about uh, which we can all be critical, but it is not the American tradition to interfere with judges. Not uh, so. In any event, here I was approaching the, my um, my um, um, election or not for the fourth term, and I really felt like stepping down. I, it was very difficult to say. And um, uh, actually, here the person who had the decisive influence on my continuing was uh, my wife. I told her I can't take it. I used uh, an expression which I um, cannot repeat here, mm -hmm. but you can imagine what I said. Um, and she said, no, you can't do it. You step down, either from the, your candidacy for judgeship or from the court as a whole. Everybody will say he realized that, that he was wrong in Gotovina. So I really had, had no choice. And here the elections come the atmosphere was uh, fairly toxic, um, and uh, I was sure that I go down, but I go down holding, standing. By, by principle, I'm not going to sort of chicken out. Um, and then the votes started being counted by the registrar. I can't believe my ears. Twelve for me, six for my opponent. So two to one which was a, a sort of a, a major validation by my colleagues of where I stood. And then there was something else which is, was a really incredible luck. As you all know, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations is the International Court of Justice. There was a case at that time which was uh, going on there, which was a case concerning genocide between Serbia 
and Croatia. And the Council for, uh, for, for Serbia um, did something which is not very usual for uh, lawyers practicing before the International Court of Justice. In arguing his case against Croatia, that Croatia committed genocide, crimes against humanity, etc., etc., he made the argument that had the majority um, chaired by me decided differently, um, his case in establishing that uh, Croatia committed genocide would have been much stronger. So, uh, in this context, it, this was not. It would, they, he attacked not only the majority opinion, but also <laughs> he said uh, Maron was wrong, and he cited one of the judges in dissent, and he was right. Um, um, so um, it, the argument was made with such uh, vigor and strength that the International Court of Justice was forced, in fact, to address the Gotovina incident. And there was a unanimous judgment of the court, uh, 15 judges of the court, and I think the two national judges, ad hoc judges, agreeing completely with the majority decision. That was one of those situations which you cannot hope for in life, but in fact, you are validated by the International Court of Justice, and this put an end to the to that controversy and to the criticism. I still was left with a very bitter feeling after that. <coughs> but um, if you cannot take the heat, don't be indicated. And um, I mean, just to just to really emphasize. The, the atmosphere at the time, it, it, it made it into the mainstream media. I remember uh, that you went on hard talk, uh, not of course to talk about the decisions, but just to talk about the uh, principles of fairness and justice uh, that the tribunal dispensed. And I know that was uh, important for you to get out there into the media uh, and, and express those, those views so strongly. Now, um, I want to go on and talk about uh, what's going on now and uh, the future of international criminal justice and to touch on Ukraine. Um, but just reflecting back on your time uh, as a, a judge and a president of the tribunals, I should tell you, and maybe you don't know this, but um, your chief of staff at the time would often complain to me that um, you would go, be going between The Hague and Arusha and you would dispense your judgment from the appeals chamber in Arusha, and you would take an overnight flight back. Uh, you would go straight to the office uh, and carry on working in your mid-70s. Uh, your chief of staff, who was in her mid-30s, at, at one point had to plead with you that she couldn't possibly continue uh, this pattern of working, and uh, she really needed to uh, go home after an overnight flight uh, to, uh, to rest. So uh, I think that indicates the energy that you brought to the role uh, personally. Um, but, but just moving then on to Ukraine, if I may. Um, and we're seeing the horrific uh, and deliberate targeting of civilians, uh, of civilian infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of talk too of accountability, of justice mechanisms, uh, domestic, regional, and uh, international. Uh, what are your views on how justice will best be served in this conflict? Well, I think that um, we should give or try to give priority <coughs> to the ICC, which is the only permanent international court which enjoys by now considerable support and credibility. Um, Ukraine, by a declaration made, I believe, in September, 2015 has accepted uh, the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And given the fact that the crimes seem to be committed on Ukrainian soil, it seems that the ICC has solid jurisdiction over crimes against humanity and war crimes which were explicitly mentioned in the declaration of uh, Ukraine in 2015. 
Um, I um, um, am aware, however, of the fact that uh, the resources and the um, capacity of the ICC is not unlimited. So I would certainly favor states in addition to the ICC taking, doing part of the job. I think that the job cannot be, that we cannot expect the ICC to handle this entire uh, problem by itself. It does not have the resources, it does not have enough judges, and we would not like to be in a situation where we have to wait 10 years or so until cases are, are decided. Um, so um, I, I do hope that countries, third countries, could um, take some of the job under the principle of universality of jurisdiction or under the criminal code. Um, I am less um, excited about the possibility of Ukraine itself judging um, Russians alleged to have committed war crimes, uh, not because Ukraine does not have uh, jurisdiction, they do have jurisdiction. Crimes have been committed on their soil. The principle of territoriality would serve them well here. Also, um, uh, of protective jurisdiction. The victims in most cases are uh, Ukrainian citizens. Um, but I think that there would be a problem of appearances here. And there is always the danger that Russia might reciprocate by resorting more frequently than it would otherwise do to trials of Ukrainians accused of war crimes. And the um, rule of law in Russia is a little bit problematic. So uh, we, have, uh, we have a problem here. I think that, uh, um, uh, I think that it is a pity that while we have a number of human rights courts in the world, Europe, Africa, Latin America, that we have not created, added to the normal civil chambers of those courts, also criminal chambers. Actually, the Africans have tried to do it in this famous Malibu Protocol, but Malibu Protocol attracted very little support, so this did not happen. Had we have um, a, a European um, a chamber, criminal chamber in Strasbourg, it would have been better. So in summary, um, the, um, uh, I have hopes with regard to the ICC. I do have hopes that we will have some national trials outside <coughs> of countries concerned. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, Ukraine has said itself, I think, that it wants to prosecute 99% uh, of, of, of the crimes that I, are being committed there. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, and, and this is obviously what you've said is uh, targeted towards war crimes and crimes against humanity, but it's right to say that there's a groundswell of, of uh, support uh, for a special tribunal for aggression. Uh, in other words, a tribunal which seeks to uh, try the perpetrators of the invasion itself. Uh, I say a groundswell of support, there's certainly support for it, uh, perhaps not uh, amongst the majority of states. But uh, what's your view on whether there should be a new tribunal set up to try the crime of aggression, which ultimately targets someone like Putin himself? See, this is a very difficult issue. I see problems and uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, uh, this would be successful, but uh, let me let me reflect uh, aloud on that problem a bit, if I may. First, uh, there is at the moment the ICC has no jurisdiction over aggression in Ukraine. The possibility of creating a special court by the Security Council, the way that the Security Cre Council created the UN War Crimes Tribunal or Ad Hoc Tribunals is thus um, completely out because of the certainty of Russian 
veto, probably also Chinese veto. So this would not happen. Now about the General Assembly option. General Assembly has the advantage, of course, as you all know, of being the most representative of the UN order. Uh, so why couldn't the General Assembly, which has adopted at least one resolution, refuse to work aggression mm -hmm. regarding the UN's uh, administration in February? Why couldn't they? Well, uh, two problems I see there. The first problem is uh, we would have a very large number of abstentions. And the abs the, those abstentions would reduce the political and moral weight of a tribunal which would be established by the General Assembly. That's the first problem. The second problem is that the General Assembly even this regarding the problem of the magnitude of its extensions, would not have legally the coercive power that the Security Council has in creating tribunals for former Yugoslavia or for Rwanda and in establishing uh, the mechanism. Now people are talk talking about the um, pooling of national um, national jurisdiction. Every state um, which has, for example, follows the principle of universal, uh, the principle of universal jurisdiction would pool with other states and give them um, power and muscle to a joint tribunal. Now the difficulty with that, as I see, that the number of countries which are on the record in supporting the principle of universality of jurisdiction is quite limited. Mm -hmm. We are talking about 20 or 30 countries. So that's uh, not uh, terribly hopeful on that. Now Ukraine, finally. Uh, Ukraine has, uh, um, Ukraine's criminal court um, has a statement on aggression. Um, uh, again, Ukraine would be able to benefit from additional principles of jurisdiction, but um, I have some problems here because although the individuals to be tried um, uh, would not be states, they would be individuals, given the fact that aggression is a leadership crime, um, um, it would look very much like uh, Ukraine trying Russia which is a little bit of an anathema in, uh, in international terms. There is another problem here, national, national jurisdiction, which will want to try Russia, would encounter, the, among other difficulties, um, defenses of immunity. Now those defenses also would be raised in international court, but they would be weaker in international. Um, having said all of that, I want to make it very clear that I believe that this is the case where in terms of merit, it's difficult to think there is full justification of trying to have the law on crimes of aggression enforced. If we are not going to enforce this principle in this case, are we going to have any any time in the future a similar serious case for enforcement, I don't know. But having said so, while I believe that there is merit in investigation and prosecution to find a legal way of doing that. And finally, there is one other point. The, um, if we take the Rome Treaty as a standard, the standard, the qualifications of leadership of a sufficiently high rank the, in the Treaty of Rome goes well beyond the qualification of leadership in Nuremberg. And to think, to be certain, to, be, to create a tribunal in the knowledge that it may very well be 
had to take dog cat of that Rabbeinu Lurina in the empty. It's a big question. Do we want to create another body like uh, the commission um, under Article 90 or 90 of the Addition Protocol 1, which has basically been jobless? So uh, I sympathize with the idea. I don't know how to do it. And maybe somebody will come with, I would welcome ideas which, um, which are, um, uh, that they can resolve this dilemma. Thank you, Ted. Um, I think we should open it up to the audience now. Um, are there any questions? For questions? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, are there any questions? Otherwise, I could, uh, I could keep going for sure. There we go. Uh, right. Uh, so we have the gentleman in the middle and the gentleman at the back. We'll start with the middle. We'll, we'll take, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take both, uh, and then you can answer them together. Ted, great to see you here. I was very interested to hear what you had to say about the situation in Ukraine and how it might play out in the future, in particular, the utility of, uh, of, of, of national criminal courts for the prosecution of these crimes, both in terms of the, the benefits they provide, but, but the possible expanded Can jurisdiction. You speak sure. Uh, I was really interested to hear what you had to say about what the, uh, what's happening in Ukraine and the possibility for future criminal trials uh, in, in, in courts of national jurisdiction as opposed to international tribunals. Uh, last week, I sat down with uh, Simon, the, with uh, uh, Ephraim uh, Zuroff, who's the uh, the director of the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center. He's participated in more than a hundred uh, trials now for uh, for uh, it, uh, connected with the uh, atrocities committed during World War II in connection with the, the Nazi regime. They resort primarily to national tribunals, both because of the. Uh, expanded uh, jurisdictional opportunities, but also because the burden of proof is often lower under national criminal law than it is under uh, the, the laws in effect uh, at the international level, i.e. The, the, the mental state required, et cetera, for murder, easier to prove often than the mental state required for uh, for the crimes in the international tribunals. But I was curious what you had to say about the, the, the credibility of national tribunals in this context. So obviously it may be, as a practical matter, easier to bring the cases to trial, win convictions in, in national tribunals, but what, how would you, what, what do you have to say about the credibility of, of, of such convictions? Are there, do, do, we, do we lose more than we gain, or is it, is it a viable alternative to the international tribunals? Tribunal. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Do we take uh, another question, sure. Ted, first, and then um, it's the gentleman right at the back there. Yeah. I have a question regarding war crime. When I was a schoolboy, I was based in Singapore. I read numerous stories about atrocities committed against the Vietnamese villagers. There was no mentioning of these two words, war crime. Last year, we witnessed the evacuations in Afghanistan. Seven human bodies dropped from the sky. But this year, when you turn on the BBC news or the mass media, every day I come across these two words, war crime in Ukraine. My question is, is there a double standard? I'm from Canada, Vancouver. Thank you very much. So uh, Ted, there were, there were two questions there. The first was uh, whether in fact there would be greater credibility with convictions in, uh, or I suppose trials, sorry, in international tribunals as opposed to national tribunals. And the second question is uh, around both the double standard that you talked about, I, I think also something uh, around whether international criminal law is politicized, that we see a plethora of tribunals um, and talk of accountability when it comes to Ukraine, uh, but very little, if anything, when we consider other atrocities that are going on around the world or over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, what's your view on those two questions? Um, credibility of international versus uh, national tribunal. I think that um, um, international criminal tribunals, despite all the challenges that they have faced, has acquired a strong measure of credibility. Um, I do not, by saying so, I do not, um, I would not like to play down 
the prospects of national jurisdiction. I think that uh, there is no reason to have a general sort of uh, negative view, comparable credibility of national court. It really depends on the country. Does the country accept the rule of law? Does the country uh, concerned have independent judiciary? Uh, is the um, judiciary a body that uh, follows simply the views of the government in power? Imagine for a moment that there would be uh, a war crimes case in, uh, in the second uh, district of uh, in New York. Imagine that there would be a war crimes case in uh, London. There is no need, no reason why, um, why those courts uh, should not be credible. Um, in my comments a few mo moments ago, I uh, supported, I, was, I promoted the idea of war crimes not being tried in countries concerned. In countries concerned, you have a much greater danger of bias. Uh, and those um, dangers are, um, are realistic. But um, in some countries, it would be credible. In some countries, it would not be. Theoretically, we might have an international tribunal, which does not meet our international expectations. But um, the international tribunals, on the whole, despite their young age, despite lots of political issues, uh, have, I think, functioned above uh, my own uh, expectation. Do we have a double standard in, in international criminal justice? I'm afraid we do. We still have a, a major problem with selectivity. We are willing to investigate or to prosecute crimes in country X, but um, country Y or Z might be protected by permanent members of the Security Council, which by casting a veto could prevent the establishment of an international criminal court. Selectivity is a real anathema to international justice, to the rule of law because the rule of law requires equality of enforcement. And if we prioritize protection of our allies over justice, this is not good, and yet this is something from which we are suffering. Um, uh, as regards um, crimes committed in Vietnam, um, actually in the United States itself at the time, there was a very strong movement um, which emphasized the fact that the international humanitarian law has not been strictly applied and enforced. It did not come to, um, there was no international push for any international criminal courts at that time. This has to start somewhere. It did not start then. But um, um, in the United States, it was already then a major issue. I think the visibility of, a, of an armed conflict is very much a relevant issue. Uh, uh, international criminal courts were established for former Yugoslavia, partly because of the, not only because of relative ceasefire between the permanent members of the Security Council, um, but also because of the so-called CNN factor. Everybody saw every day on the television what was happening in former Yugoslavia. So in fact, the tribunals were created at least partly because there was a strong pressure of public opinion. Were it not for that pressure, the tribunals uh, would not have been established. Um, Yes, uh, we may be paying more attention to Ukraine than we are paying to crimes committed in, uh, in the Congo or in the Central African Republic, but maybe um, um, a reason for that is that those crimes in Ukraine 
are so much more visible, they are so, clo so much closer to us geographically. We cannot uh, open the television set or switch on the radio today without knowing about the latest uh, uh, bombings of uh, civilian objects or civilian infrastructure. So there are, um, there are explanations, but those explanations are political. We should have a common approach to all serious international crimes. We do not have this yet, but we must start somewhere. It's better to have international um, justice in some cases than not to have them anywhere. Right, uh, we are at time. Two more questions, great, because there were two hands that went up. So uh, we've got the lady here and the gentleman there. Hi, um, I'm a DPhil student at Nuffields in international relations studying the... Sorry. I'm a doctoral student in international relations studying the development of international criminal law institutions. And I have sort of two related questions. The first is, have you noticed a change in the time that you've been involved in these institutions in the kinds of credentials that are considered relevant to be appointed to international courts when you submitted your CV for the first time you were elected? As a judge, I mean. Yeah, to be appointed as a judge. What have the expectations of what kinds of experience are relevant changed from the 1990s or from the early 2000s to today? And the second question is, given that judges and prosecutors at international tribunals are all legal professionals and legal experts, but they come from different countries and different domestic legal systems and educational backgrounds, what would you say is the most important factor that allows people within these courts to work together despite perhaps having different ideas of, say, what the role of a judge is or how investigations should occur or what criminal procedure should be like in domestic systems. Thank you. And the question that, yeah, just that. Um, hi, Judge Marion, sorry. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you, I think when I look across the kind of war crimes um, that have happened across a lot of jurisdictions, whether you're looking at Burma, Argentina, the former Yugoslavia. Um, one particular thing that links them all is the abhorrent tr treatment of women in those areas, specifically through crimes of sexual violence. Um, and I think to date there's only been, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think two prosecutions for sexual violence um, in international criminal law. Um, so I wondered whether you thought that international criminal law is doing enough to protect women in these jurisdictions and whether it has a greater capacity to be protecting this vulnerable group that is facing a lot of um, issues in almost every conflict worldwide. Thank you. Let me just repeat those uh, questions. So uh, we had one about uh, the international judiciary and the, the different qualities <laughs> that are required to become an international judge, whether that has changed over the last, say, decade or two uh, since the establishment of the ICTY. Um, uh, and then there was a separate question also on the judiciary, um, which I think relates to the fact that judges come from all different types of uh, legal backgrounds and cultures. What do you think is required to ensure that they can work together properly for the common good? in these, in these uh, tribunals. Um, and then there was a question on uh, sexual violence and the role of the uh, international tribunals in uh, passing judgment on, on these crimes. And I think, uh, in fact, it's a great question for, for you in particular because of the role that you have, have played in, in, in this area. Thank you. I will start from from this question on um, gender crimes. Um, as we know, despite the immense resort to rapes 
during the Second World War, rapes were not prosecuted in Nuremberg. I think it is a pity that they were not, but it reflected perhaps the fact that uh, at that time uh, rape was not taken as seriously as other crimes. Um, <coughs> in uh, 1993, when the tribunal was being, for Yugoslavia, <coughs> was being established, uh, I uh, wrote an editorial article in the American Journal lamenting the state of international law in gender crime. At that time, I would like to remind you, rapes committed in, <coughs> in non-international countries are not regarded as international crime. I argued that um, this is a situation which is not acceptable <coughs> and that it must change very rapidly. So it was uh, one of the sort of surprises in my own life that, in, that was 1993, that article. And then in 2002, Soon after my <coughs> arrival at The Hague, I found myself a member of the appeals bench in a, a case called, the famous case called, sorry, called Kunarak, which pertained to a municipality in Bosnia by the name of Foča. It was a small town, and 30 or 40, it was uh, in Serb control, and a number, small number of um, uh, Serb soldiers, no ser sergeants, no officers, no, um, no higher authority, appropriated to themselves a number of Muslim teenage girls for sexual service. It was an absolutely shocking case. They were kept as sexual slaves for several months. They were sold and traded, and the trading people insisted on Deutsche Mark. That was the only currency that they would accept. It was a horrifying case. So when we got this case, I said to myself, life is very strange. I can now I was not pre president at that time. <coughs> it was one year before I became president of the court. But I felt I could play a role. And in that case, we did something quite spectacular in terms of this seismic shift in international approach to gender crime. We found the defendants guilty of uh, rape as war crimes, we found the defendants guilty of crimes against, um, against humanity for sexual enslavement. We rejected the argument of the appellants that continuous con resistance <coughs> and physical force are essential to proving rape. We established that coercive circumstances and absence of consent are the key factors. We found that rape constitutes torture in international law. And in addition to dealing with that case, over time we changed rules of procedure of the tribunal to make it easier to prosecute cases of uh, sexual aggression or rape by providing inter alia that prior sexual conduct cannot be brought as evidence or as a defense. So we brought in a complete revolution of that. And in fact, we played a major role because here a certain synergy was playing out between national courts and international courts. We established a model but that model would only have real validity and force if it were followed subsequently by national courts. 
A few years later, I was invited to London to a, a summit on sexual, uh, sexual violence and try to push some of those ideas. And this synergy um, is very, very significant. International tribunals can establish a model, a new model, but those models must be followed up in national legislation and nation countries. Uh, that is about, um, about rape I, and, um, and development of the law of that. Uh, today, uh, rape is on the agenda on, of any prosecution which is contemplated for crimes being committed in the Ukraine and elsewhere. Let's hope that this will be followed up and not be forgotten. Appointments of judges, uh, I think that we now have a much more transparency and visibility. The International Criminal Court, for example, the Assembly of State Parties has formed advisory body bodies which scrutinize the credentials of judges. And I do hope that this kind of model in this or similar form can be followed for, for other courts, courts and tribunals. Um, how do judges work together? This is one of, has been one of the more fascinating questions that we have encountered in UN, UN war crimes tribunals. The UN war crimes tribunal started from basically an Anglo-Saxon common law adversarial system rather than the civil law inquisitorial system. And insofar as the substance of the law is concerned, we still have basically the Anglo-Saxon common law system. But when it comes to evidence or procedure, we have strongly moved towards the civil law system because it provided perhaps more efficient way of managing for judges, of managing the courtroom. We do not follow the common law rule of um, hearsay evidence. We attach less probative value to hearsay evidence, but we do not reject it as, as such. We accept increasingly written documents, and we have increased the power of judges for more effective management of the courtroom. And these same issues are very relevant because they reflect the fact that we had these problems, reflect the fact that judges come with different cultures. And actually, it's amazing how well, because we made those compromises towards the civil law, how well the system is working. Although at all times, the majority of judges, I did not check whether it was all times, but it gives you an idea. Majority of judges in ad hoc tribunals have come from a civil law discipline. There has been a great deal of acceptance on their part of the fact that the principal substantive law is still governed by common law adversarial principles. Um, I believe I have answered yes, the question. Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, Ted, thank you so much uh, for taking us through the fascinating journey of your life and also giving us your thoughts on uh, Ukraine, uh, on uh, the future of uh, accountability there. Uh, and um, I think it's fair to say that there, there are a whole host of things I think we can say to sum up your, your career and your, your life. You talked about reincarnation, actually, uh, in, in, in this role. But I think, I think honor, I, I think principle, and I think fairness uh, really go to the heart of everything you've done and everything you've achieved. So thank you so much for uh, holding this event uh, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you.